welcome to the Crimmy Talk. I'm Jen, same again as usual. Um, and this month we are going to be discussing the probation service. Um, and the National Probation Service is a statu statutory criminal justice service um, in and around, obviously, the United Kingdom. So I have got two lovely guests with me today, and I'll leave them to introduce themselves. And Sarah, do you want to begin? Yeah, OK. Um, thanks for having me on the Crim Talk. Um, so, yeah, I'm Sarah Edwards, and I have worked for the Ministry of Justice for about 10 years, and for six of those years, I was a probation officer. So um, I know about everything to do with probation. I'm now an online tutor for psychology and criminology, and I'm also an author, so I've written a book called, you can kind of see it in the background, Success on Probation. I should have come prepared and got it here. Success on probation, a step-by-step -step system to reform your life and release yourself from your mental jail. And it is a book that it's kind of helps you motivate and achieve your goals. So just like we would do when working with offenders, but this is for everyone, um, and particularly mums, because I'm a mum as well. So I'm a mum of two. So that's me. Thank you. Yeah, and right. I guess I'll go then. One, I might have to invest in that book, you know. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. I'm going to get it. I'll, I'll, I'll get it for you afterwards. So I can... Okay, great. Um, so if you haven't seen the show before, my name's Tyler. I've done a couple of um, discussions for the Crimmy Talk. Um, I'm one of the team uh, and I'm a professional policing student at BCU, Birmingham City University. Thank you guys. That was nice and easy, nice and smooth. <laughs> so uh, that just brings me, we've only got like three questions today. Two or three? Three? Yeah, so it's going to be short. I think it's three. Yeah, yeah three. <laughs> short and sweet, <laughs> like me. Uh, so um, what, just for the listeners and the viewers, uh, what would you consider to be the main role or purpose of the, pr the probation service? Yeah, um, so the probation service, how I would explain it to kind of people that don't know is it works with offenders. So once they've been um, sentenced for an offence, um, they can either be going to prison or probation. They can get both. And we would work with both of them. It's not just people on probation. We also work with people in prison. But the main aims are rehabilitation. So to obviously rehabilitate them when they're in prison, when they come out. Resettlement, so we help them resettle back into their community. Um, protecting the public is one of the key things. Obviously, we are working in helping reduce rehabilitation, in helping, not reduce rehabilitation, but in helping stopping people commit crimes, we're then protecting the public. Um, we also kind of look out for like victim safety. So there's a part, part in there where we have like victim liaisons officer. Um, so it's kind of an agency that's focused on rehabilitation, protecting the public, um, but it is still a criminal justice kind of authority. So there is still some aspects in probation that is kind of enforcement. So we still have to enforce the law as well. So it's kind of a bit of both. Um, I hope that explains for people. And, and one thing, I don't know about your viewers or your listeners, I didn't know anything about probation. So it's yeah it's, it's kind of not really out there unless you're like specifically looking for it or you've been affected by it personally I don't really know what it is so I hope that helps understand what it is yeah well it helped me because uh, yeah. I didn't realize I'm, I'm aware of what the probation do and I I think the only thing I always think about is rehabilitation and to prevent recidivism um, yeah then you kind of do forget about the nuances in you know protecting the public and you know, because I think everyone automatically defaults that position to policing and authority, other authorities. So, um, yeah. yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Do you have um, yeah. anything to add on that, Tyler, or do you kind of? Um, I, I think obviously Sarah's the expert, so she's explained it perfectly. But obviously, like sort of like through research I've done is, you know, it's kind of like challenging those who have either like gone to prison or come out of prison and they're serving sentences. Um, I think there's an element of challenging them to change their lives as well so they don't end up back within that cycle. Um, I think it can be a vicious cycle. Get out of prison, all right, forget the probation service, I'm going to go re-offend again. They re-offend and it's just a vicious cycle. So I think trying to break that cycle is something that is yeah. really integral within the probation service as well, from yeah. what I've seen of it anyway. 
from people it, I know and family members and stuff like that. It would be interesting as well, like how do they explain <clears throat> information service from the police training point of view? Do they explain it in a similar way or is there much focus on that in the police training? Well, from from like from like my experiences at uni, there's not really much talks of sort of like after, like what happens after when someone's sentenced yeah. and everything. Yeah, Obviously, we've yeah. done things about criminal law and the law courts and everything, but sort of um, about the probation service, it's never really touched on. And I think it's a good sort of like I think it is a good liaison to have with the police yeah. and the probation service to sort of um, help offenders to stop offending. Yeah, because there is, is a lot that happens afterwards. So to kind of skip over that bit, like when you're studying and stuff, like you're missing out on so much. Yeah. And it's like some of the reasons why that cycle keeps happening is all about what's happening after. Um, and the probation service works with like loads of different agencies as well in the criminal justice system, which is why it's really useful to see how the police, you know, put it in their training, because we do work together with the police. Um, no, sorry, I didn't realise. Yeah, 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 no, I finished, yeah. I was going to say, I think it is important. And I think the role of probation does get kind of brushed under the carpet in the wider criminal justice system, because I've gone out and I've delivered, like, talks about the overall criminal justice system. And I always talk about, you know, um, obviously not giving away my uh, resources, but um, I, always, I always talk about, you know, the entire process, where, like if obviously as an offender or as a victim, the process you would go through and the kind of organisations you would meet, um, and amongst a few like kind of other organizations like victim support um, probation always I always get questions about oh I didn't realize probation done that or queries and you know and I, I'm like they're actually more important or more imperative within the criminal justice system than people believe because you're a conduit between inside obviously you I suppose you're probably the only agency aside from maybe the police that kind of have an in inside knowledge about an offender while they're in prison and when yeah. they yeah 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 so literally from the whole journey you know from like even pre-sentence or before they get sentenced we are responsible for writing their pre-sentence report so it's literally the whole way um which is yeah something I didn't realize so as a criminology student it was just prison so I came out of uni thinking I just want to work in prison because that's kind of all I knew um so yeah yeah um do you guys have anything to add before i move on to the next one no, I haven't no yeah this is really informative i like this um so <laughs> i feel like i'm learning so much yeah no oh, i really already yeah, yeah. No, like I, said, I didn't really just from that one question I'm <laughs> so wow it's, and the thing is you no know, when you're like working it's like just every day for me so it's kind of like I don't really, you know, like I don't even realise that. Yeah, it's become second nature to this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's interesting as well, because like you, as the probation service, you do so much. And like I said, you know, us as members of the public don't realise, you know, when yeah. me as us, well, us as academics as well, we don't realise the extent because that's not really something, unless obviously I'm assuming maybe some institutions you can get specific modules, but that wasn't something that was taught to me I remember learning about the penal system and stuff like that but yeah. it makes you think as well you know offenders maybe you know that have been in the system and stuff do they even recognize or understand the full extent or the capabilities of prob the probation service yeah I guess it, it really varies because you've got the offenders that have been in the system for so long and then you know then you've got some people that have heard stories from in prison so it really does vary, but I think, yeah, even for the offenders, they, you know, they probably don't know the full capacity and which is where kind of managing people's expectation comes in as well, because especially if they've been listening to other people in prison or they were on probation years ago, things change and move on. And what they thought of the probation services was may not be what we actually do. And that's when it, you know, there becomes that tension between, oh, you're, you know, you might get offenders saying to you, oh, you know, you're not doing this, you're not doing that, but you really have to, like, explain expectations of the service to them. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that brings me to kind of, well, you made a mention of, obviously, like, the changes over time, so that kind of hmm. feeds me into the next question. So, obviously, um, I'm not going to give away the year yet because that will reveal our competition answer, um, but the, we do know that the probation service was part privatised, Um do you think that that was a necessary step 
for the probation yeah. so or did it no, definitely not oh. so as as a probation so obviously now you've told me I won't say the year but when it happened um I think I just qualified um and it caused so much disruption in the service so like you mentioned before you know probation service is national so um it's you know all over England and Wales we don't deal with the Scotland or Northern Ireland it's just England Wales so it is everywhere there's an office literally in every town but you said you're in Birmingham there'll be like a couple of offices in Birmingham all of that so when it happened how they done it was kind of cheeky to everyone because you had you have like your normal caseload so your caseload would be like low risk offenders medium and high risk so you low is things like first time offenders shoplifting you know crimes where you're not going to get the serious punishment medium is things like you might get some like lower end um, offenses like harassment assault drug offenses and then your high risk are you know people that are at risk of causing real serious harm you know like gbh murder that kind of thing so what they did is they just captured everyone's information on your caseload and said, right, you're going to the private company, you're staying with MPS. So it was CRC MPS. So how they done it was kind of really unfair. And, you know, they did say, you know, everyone prepare your cases before, but that, you know, there were some people that had qualified the year before me and because they just qualified, they had the lower risk offence, like, cases so they were automatically going to the private sector and then there was the kind of issues about well do you get to keep because the probation service is, is government um being employed by the government so there is quite good perks of working in the public sector so there was the fear that all that was going to be taken away you know all your year service you've built up your holiday pay your pay increments um just things like that so it was just the way it kind of happened and at the time it happened, so we would all be in one office. Then they moved the CRC people upstairs or downstairs. So then we were on different floors. So they were splitting, like really, it was really split between the teams. So people that had worked there for years were then split. And it just didn't cause a good atmosphere, but it was like, yeah, we need to be separate because eventually we'll be getting separate offices. Um, and then like services at the beginning, I mentioned that probation work with other agencies. So say back in the day, we would have maybe an alcohol and drug worker sitting there with us in the team. They'd be employed by someone else sitting with us in the team. We may have someone from the police there. Um, you may have an accommodation worker. All of that was then put out to all the agencies, put back to where they were. And we had to do loads of paperwork that was really unnecessary so normally you'd just be able to go to the housing office and walk over to their desk and say oh i need an appointment for this person or this is going on with that person and they really knew you and knew the person you're working with whereas the privatization made it that you have to complete something on the system complete a referral form wait for that to be sent off wait to it be allocated and it kind of just gets lost in the system so when you're rehabilitating offenders an important aspect is working together with organizations so if that part of the process has been made difficult for staff it does have a knock-on effect for the offenders yeah um and i felt like there were promises of through the gate stuff so this is stuff where when a prisoner comes out of prison they have like a caseworker in prison that helps them with like accommodation getting their benefits set up all that kind of practical stuff and I felt like there were promises of that happening and it just never did. Like, I don't remember one person successfully having a through the gate worker. Um, so yeah, I guess like em empty promises that didn't really, you know, happen. The, the paperwork side of it. Um, and then, yeah, just splitting the teams and now again without giving it on you kind of think well it was a waste what what was the point of that exercise and it also felt like the people making the decision like what made them make that decision did they talk to people actually on the ground you know was it just a decision they had upstairs you know in government yeah. which is another thing i'm really interested in is like policy and how they make decisions like you need to talk to people actually working on the front line not just 
make your decisions from up high um yeah. but it'd be interesting to know like tyler did you were you aware like i don't know if like the general public were aware of, of privatization or people that uh, technology at, at the time i was well i'm not going to give too much away but i was in like school school sort yeah. of age yeah, when it yeah, happened yeah. so yeah. i i probably would have known anything but so from like what i've read it, it just sounded unnecessary now that they're sort of going back on everything that they did before to now changing it but i think it's more of a thing like it wasn't necessary to do in the first place but it was kind of like you learn from your mistakes sort of things and it's a massive mistake because for the people you're trying to rehabilitate they kind of got screwed to be honest because really just like the staff got screwed they got screwed so really, yeah um, you know it just i think it gives them more ideas on how the public sector can get involved with rehabilitation but you shouldn't have given them that responsibility at first because then the government ended up having to bail them out which yeah. defeated the object of the whole process but this and is but, okay, yeah. Go on, Jen, yeah. but this is where you know the, the the point that sarah made about like policy and stuff like that it becomes so intriguing because like you say tyler you know it, they learn from the mistakes but when you're in a like this isn't me kind of getting at the government now but just from a political standpoint is when you you're making policies you have to ensure that it kind of you know a bit of a jeremy bentham kind of thing greater good greater good greater good for the greater number my god i couldn't get my words out um, <laughs> um and essentially that didn't happen there should have been a sense of you know did they did they really risk assess what was gonna you know the outcomes did they really think about how uh, you know they were going to generate a diver divisive culture within you know the work environments and the offices because yeah. imagine the office that you worked in sarah probably another office in maybe i don't know somewhere down south would have probably experienced very similar things yeah um, i remember everyone experienced the same like cause, yeah because i remember being um of that within that year i was still at university and i remember it being hot a hot topic you know um and my lecturer saying oh you know you need to kind of understand this process and you know the the nuances around it and i just thought well i'm not going into probation so i'm not gonna yeah and i feel like you can't like i feel like it's but, difficult to understand unless you're in it and experiencing it mm -hmm. you know privatization you hear loads of things getting privatized don't you, you know like royal mail getting privatized at nhs like you kind of just hear it but unless you're kind of in it experiencing it it's difficult to understand what is the impact of that and if it has any impact yeah it's true um, um but like i think you know I, I, yeah over time i've kind of seen and i think maybe the you know the more i've worked within the criminal justice system i've actually seen like the impact that it's had and it's it's not good um however yeah. like I said, you kind of learn from your mistakes and I think it's kind of driven by like payment by results as well. And that kind of didn't sit comfortably with me and a lot of people. Like, like where does payment come into it? You know, like pro profit, like the first thought is, okay, you profiting off of people being on probation or people getting into programs. Um, so yeah, that didn't really seem right with the kind of service we're offering, like to like, be profiting from that. Yeah. Um, and even now, like it's, it's not, yeah, it's not really clear. Like, like, did they profit from it? Did they lose from it? Well, I've got no idea. Because, like I said, people upstairs making these big decisions. Yeah, um, I, and I, I remember. Yeah, no, I was, on, yeah. I always say every decision, somebody got a promotion. I always say that. And yeah, it's probably yeah, yeah, yeah. Out there that, like you say, that has you know profited from it. But then when you think of the the unfortunate things, you know, with thousands of members of staff across the country you know offenders not receiving services that they need and event eventually yeah. more than likely you know going back in and reoffending and you know the yeah. knock-on effect it has just because maybe potentially somebody got a promotion who knows yeah i think that's the saddest part of it to be honest because obviously you have these people who may want to change their lives you know when they when this kind of thing happens it kind of you know you can't provide the services in order for them to change their lives yeah. so they're, they're yeah. just saying well, screw it. I might as well go back and do what I was doing anyway. And that is so it always has a knock-on effect. While someone up there is getting a promotion, someone, someone say, brother, for example, is back on the street doing what they were doing, going back into prison yeah. and hurting their family. So it, you know, it is it isn't just that one person. It is a family. It may be friends that are seeing their one of their best mates locked up or something. It's you and know, I think I, I think feel, it's a big thing with young people these days as well. That's where I feel the disparity is like 
you're talking to someone, you know, someone's brother might be impacted, someone's cousin, whatever. I don't imagine that's even crossed the mind of the policy makers at the top. Like it's not even entering their thought zone. So that's why I'm really keen to like, I'm working with an organization called Telescope who are trying to bring together like policy makers and frontline staff because they're, you know, we're the ones that can actually make a difference in their decision making. Yeah. Um, right. Um. I've just. I'm just going to quickly go on to the final question. You've. I think you've. To be fair, pretty much covered. Um. Everything. Um. But are there any like just one that you can think of main challenges for the probation at the moment in this current climate? I know I can think of one, but it might be a bit obvious. So I'll with you guys. Is this the third question or the yeah, third and final one? Yeah. <laughs> All right. The the challenges. Yeah. Um, what are the challenges? Obviously, COVID now has impacted significantly, significantly. And I feel like one of the challenges, I kind of feel like it's kind of got two challenges. We've got the challenge now to deal with COVID and everything. Because, and we were having phone contact with offenders and like, you can't do meaningful work with someone when you're, you know, on the phone, talking with them, you know, it just didn't work out. But so that is the challenge of obviously people's lives have been impacted loads more by COVID. So, um, and it, it kind of brings me to the, the last question as well about government, when they're making changes or when something happens with COVID and stuff, um, the, I lost my train of thought now. <laughs> But yeah, COVID definitely is going to be a challenge for the probation service to figure out how they can kind of manage the rehabilitation cycle, the offending cycle. Um, and then another challenge that always seems to be a challenge with the probation service is staffing. So like getting staff in and retaining staff because, you know, I myself have left the probation service. I wouldn't say I was in there for a long, long period of time. There's been people that have been there in years, but retaining staff is something I feel they need to work on. And that kind of go coincides with things like um, caseload levels. I think that is probably one of the main things because they try to cut back, try to cut budgets. So they cut staff and that then has an impact on you being able to do your work, being able to do your job properly. So. Yeah, definitely. How about you, Tyler? What do you think? Is... Um, I was going to say sort of like environment. So sort of like when someone sort of comes out of prison, they're going, they're more than likely are going to be going back into the environment which caused them to re like offend in the first place. Yeah. So I think in terms of like young people, for example, um, say they now are coming out of um, any sort of punishment that they've gone through, they're going back into say their area where they were doing things that got them sort of locked yeah. up or in trouble in the first place and I think even when you try and take them out of that situation the probation service can't really stop them from finding those grassroots again and go into areas that resemble the, the initial area in the first place so like it makes things like gang culture and sort of our being on road and being on the block and stuff it makes it harder for the probation service to try and control and to yeah. try and like yeah. change within people even sort of grown people who have been in that stop them from doing that because it's ingrained in them in a sense so I think even just going to prison they're like eh, it's no biggie I'll be out in no time you know yeah. back, back with my brethren and everything like that so and when yeah. and you know a combination of you know well, everything that you've both said you know COVID, um, people being released from prison you know low staffing levels low retention rates there's evidently an issue with the probation and it's or should I say there's evidently an issue in my opinion with the wider broader criminal justice system because it's not just you know we can't put you know all the the world on the probation shoulders um, but from the probation's perspective I do think there should be a little bit more work to just ensure things are a bit more streamlined because this isn't the first time I've heard of probation issues um and I'm pretty damn sure it won't be the last yeah. Um, but yeah so um that kind of brings me to the end of the questions um for this month's topic 
um, just to quickly give you guys a rundown that are either listening or watching, um, we did run our competition this month and it was based on the probation service. We asked in what year was the probation service part privatised and the answer was 2014. We had a lot of entries and this is essentially how the competition went. And congratulations to our winner. Uh, I'll be in touch or somebody on the Primer Talks account will be in touch and we will get your book posted out to you. And congratulations. Thank you, Tyler. And thank you, Sarah. You guys have been great.